to you, sir. Hello. Thank you for having us. So uh, <clears throat> I just start by uh, telling you the format that we're going to have today. We're Alexi's going to sit in this chair. I'm going to sit in this chair. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Alexi questions. He's going to ask me questions. And hopefully I'll ask him some questions that he doesn't like me to ask him, so we'll get some interesting answers. So my first question is, um, Alexi, in 1984, how did you come up with Tetris? Well, it was in 1984, and I was a researcher and programmer in Computer Center of Academy of Science of USSR. It was still USSR. And uh, I did a lot of prog programming and research in computer science, but really my heart was in puzzles and riddles and all this funny stuff out of mathematics. So in my spare time, I tried to put together some games for, for the computer, and Tetris was one of them. Uh, I always enjoyed the very well-known puzzle called Pentamina. It's a box with uh, different uh, shapes made out of five squares. So that's about all you could do out of five squares, which is on the screen. It's uh, 12 different shapes. And it's a wonderful set for puzzles. You take it, you rearrange it, you put some kind of beautiful shapes out of it. But when you try to put it back in the box, you gonna <laughs> spend good hour probably for that. It's really, it's really complicated puzzle. So I admire this puzzle for, for all my uh, childhood and all my life. And once I decided that it would be a very good set to put together two-player board game on computer. And I start programming it, and uh, you know that time the procedures, uh, all the procedures the programmer mu must do himself. It was no any, any libraries or anything like that at that time. So when I put those routines to, to, to arrange the stuff on the screen and I saw how the pieces are rotated there, it was very funny to watch. And that was the moment when I think that the real-time game with those pieces would be something uh, interesting to try. That's how it started. So, and uh, what, did you, what did you think when you saw the Ted Tetris first time? When was it? So, it was, at, uh, it was here in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electron Electronics Show um, in 1988. And... Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I had a publishing company in Japan at the time, and I was looking for games to bring back to Japan. So I would go from machine to machine, play the games a little bit, and then uh, try to talk with the, uh, the publishers of those games. And um, when I first stopped at Tetris, I looked at it. It looked too simple. Um, but I'm a puzzler myself, so I said, well, you know, let me give it a try. So I, so I went and I played. And um, the next time I had a break between meetings, I found myself standing in line again. And then I found myself standing in line again. And by about the fourth time that I stood in line waiting to play this game, I realized that I was hooked. And it's very hard to get hooked on a game at a, at a game show because generally it takes too long to get hooked to a game. And, uh, and I was hooked. So um, there was something about it. And um, so that's when I started negotiating. And, and that's how my, my first look at, uh, at Tetris. So in, in the first prototype of uh, Tetris, was there anything that you didn't <laughs> like and changed? Well, you know, no. I, I was very lucky to find very appropriate uh, kind of features for all the mechanics. I like the pieces, I like the size of the board. I still like it, 20 by 10 is kind of perfect for this stuff. Uh, I was really scared to, to do something uh, with the scoring system. I, I was really scared to overcomplicate it. So the future, the further, the further changes were, were very useful for it. So what we did for 
for uh, Game Boy version with double, triple, and Tetris was really an important step in, in the game. But since the, the concept of the game didn't change too much, we add some other uh, little stuff in the game which is little but important, but, but the game, main mechanics are still there. Yeah, so. And do you remember when you first get to Electron Arc Technica? And uh, that, that's funny. I'm curious, would you do it again today if you could? Okay, so I have to explain what Electron Arc Technica actually is. Um, you know, I. Um, when I licensed Tetris from Spectrum Holobyte for PC, there was a whole long chain of, of companies in the uh, copyright notice. And so it went from Academy Soft, which is the Academy of Science, to Electronarch Technica, which is still, it's a trade organization in Moscow. And from there it went to Andromeda, which was a Hungarian company. There it went from there, it went to Mirrorsoft, uh, which is a UK company, and from Mirosoft it went to Spectrum Holobyte, and from Spectrum Holobyte, a US company, it went to me in Japan. And so <clears throat> Electronic Technica was in that copyright notice, and so I tracked them down in Moscow. I had, a, I had an interpreter, I hired an interpreter, and I tracked down the building, and I said, let's go, and she said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? She says, you can't go in there. And I said, what do you mean, you, I can't go in there? And she said, you're not invited, you need an official paper, you need to have written them, and I said, I didn't come all this way to stand in front of a door and not go inside, you know? So I said, I'm going in, are you coming with me? And she said, no, I'm not. I thought, wow, that's pretty, pretty weird. Okay, fine, anyway, I walked through the door, and uh, I said, I'm the guy who published Tetris in Japan, I held up my box, and this little old man comes walking down. Little old man turned out to be not so old. He was my age. He looked like a little old man, Mr. Belikoff. Mr. Belikoff walks down the stairs, shakes my hand and says, and they all have this vice grip. All the Russians do vice grip sh handshake, you know. <laughs> and he asks me, what do you, what do, you do? I says, I, I publish Tetris in Japan uh, for the Nintendo machine. And, he's, and he looked at my package and he says, we never licensed this game for, to the console. And, I, and I'm going like, holy smokes. <laughs> Say a nice word there, holy smokes. Because at that moment in time, I had uh, 200,000 cartridges uh, in manufacture. That's, a, that's $10 a piece, that's $2 million. That was all of the land that my, in, that my in-laws had at the time that I'd use as collateral <laughs> to borrow money to get Nintendo to build these cartridges. And if I didn't get paid from distribution, like if somebody came and said, stop the press right there, I would have, had, I would have lost $2 million. It's way more money than I, I had. Anyway, um, that's, that's what I walked into. And I, you know, after I sort of like choked, I, um, I decided to focus on the matter at hand. As I'm here to uh, license the, the rights uh, for Game Boy, and we'll talk about the other rights later. And uh, would I do that today? Um, no, I, I, I guess a lot of it had to do with naivety <laughs> at the time. So, uh, you know, it's like going to North Korea today and, and uh, trying to license a North Korean game. <laughs> Just don't do it. Um, but anyway, do you, <laughs> do you remember meeting me for the first time? Well, of course I do. I do. Um, Day before, they say that's a kind of strange, small potato businessman should, should come visit. Would I like to meet him or not? I say, yes, well, I, I do. So uh, I try to, co to cooperate with Electron or Technic at that time, and we kind of work together, try to, to, to put the, all this publishing kind of together. And when I saw you, the, the first impression was kind of inspired by this kind of introduction. I see young Asian guy who, who was very scared and whatever. So I, di I, I didn't think that something serious coming. I think it's just a 
polite small talks or, or kind of attempt to grab some piece of property or whatever. But when you start talking, I, I realized that first time I, I met the real game designer because, because the knowledge of the stuff and the passion for the game is, uh, is something you can't hide. So we, be, we start like each other right away, being surrounded with all these bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, was, it hard, uh, was it hard to get all these rights for Tetris that time, was it? I, you know, it was the biggest deal that I had ever done um, till that time, um, or it was going to be the biggest deal. And I was doing it under duress because I knew that my, you know, that, that I would be uh, dead meat if, <laughs> if I'd lost my, my in-laws, their property. Um, I spent a week or 10 days. After being there for like two days, they, they asked me, when are you coming back? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we'd like to have you know, time to think over your offer. I said, no, I'm not coming back. Either I leave here with the rights or, or I leave here without the rights, but I'm not coming back. I don't have that kind of time. Uh, I could feel from the way they were doing things that, they, that they'd never really done business deals before, or normal business deals anyway. Um, and so I decided that I was going to play their game, which was to be a little heavy-handed, and I, I, as legally as possible, made them an offer. And this, this offer is, you know, if it's not, uh, how can I say, if you don't do a counter with so many days, within so many days, this offer is null and void, and, you know, I use these big words and so on. A few days into it, um, I realized I was going somewhere, I was getting somewhere, and I phoned my, my attorney in, in Japan, and I said, <clears throat> listen, and a, and a phone call at this time takes eight hours. You, you call the operator, ask for the call, and then you have to wait by the phone for eight hours, and during that eight hours, your call could come through any time, and so you have to be there, otherwise the eight hours starts from scratch. So I'd been waiting for eight hours, and finally the call got through. I said to my lawyer, this is the fax number. Yeah, I want you to write me a 20-page contract to so give me all the rights from the Russians that I need to give Nintendo the rights. So it has to satisfy Nintendo, no more than 20 pages, because I'm, and no big words. I'm going to have to explain every word in this contract. And we're not going to have a second shot at it, so it has to be a fair contract. Fair for them, fair for me. And uh, so 24 hour late, uh, hours later, I got the best contract I've ever seen in the industry. <laughs> that is true. And uh, it, was, it was great. So, yeah. And how, how did you deal with Nintendo afterwards? Was it hard to, get to, to work on the Game Boy version? And, and so, stuff? yeah, I... I um, I made the deal with Nintendo, and, uh, and they, um, Mr. Harakawa said that he was going to include it in every Game Boy that he sold in, uh, in the, everywhere in the world except, the, uh, except Japan, where they didn't have the policy of packing in a game. Um, I had to pretend to Nintendo, because I really was a small potato in, at the time, that the Russians, which was supposedly this big, tough organization, which actually it wasn't, um, were not going to accept this and this and this. So I did things, and I apologize to all of you who played Game Boy Tetris, but uh, I forced them to put my copyright screen on this, uh, displayed for four seconds. So after four seconds, you can click through, and if you didn't do anything, it would stay up for eight seconds. And uh, of course, I made all that stuff up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, like, the two days or three days before they were going to master um, we're, we're, I'm playing the, the, uh, what they're mastering, and, and uh, the random number generator is wrong. One of the pieces was coming out twice, twice as much, almost, as the other pieces. And I told my guys to count them and show me the frequency, and, and they did. And I called Nintendo and said, this is not going to pass. The Russians are not going to accept, because the random number generator is not random. And if you're looking at, looking at a game like Mario, it doesn't matter because the game, the game doesn't need any real random numbers. And in fact, no games at the time needed a real random number generator. Well, they came on Saturday and we worked all day and fixed their random number generator so it was random. 
and, and they mastered on Monday. So, yeah, I pretended to be a little bit bigger than I was <laughs> in talking to Nintendo and in talking to the Russians. <laughs> in looking at our history with Tetris, um, is there anything that you would have done differently? Well, you know, usually, usually this question is asked about uh, the fact that I give up my rights for Tetris for uh, my computer center for 10 years. And that's, uh, that was the main thing uh, everybody suppose I'm complaining about. But, you know, I, I wouldn't do it differently even now because... Because it wasn't kind of, it was a strategic decision which, uh, which I did right. And I am, I am kind of proud of my kind of vision that time. Because otherwise, if I start kind of fighting for my royalty or for my rights, uh, Tetris, w uh, Tetris would be surrounded by, by war, but not the peace. But, but because of uh, this, my step, we kind of conglomerate the efforts and everybody helped me to, 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 to publish it rather than stop me from it. So basically I wouldn't, I wouldn't do differently if, if it happens again. But I did a lot of really, really sloppy steps at that time because I was naive and inexperienced, that's for sure. And what about you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. You know, I, I, I could see that a, a lot of the things that I did were due to inexperience, um, but they, they ended up being really important lessons in the end. Um, and I, I didn't do anything along the way which <clears throat> made me lose the ability to publish Tetris or make the Tetris company and, or lose your friendship, for example. So I think that, you know, just by keeping it simple and saying, well, look, the, the most important relationship in the whole Tetris business is the relationship between me and Alexei. And it has been since the very beginning. He's the guy who made the game, and I'm the guy who, who helped to make money out of it. So, so that's a real good combination, and we don't like step on each other's feet, not that often, and not that hard. So I, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. Um, I think... I think that uh, that I'm with you on this point. That uh, that the business, uh, that uh, the friendly business relationship was the key moment in the, in the history of of Tetris as a as a product, and and as a game, as a part of culture. Look at me! I don't have a beard uh, yet. <laughs> and do you think it's still important now? What the friendship? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's the most important thing. You know, with, with, the, with that, with the, the friendship and the trust, yeah, everything else, you know, the contracts and all that, that's all my weasels talking to somebody else's weasels and, and uh, sorry if there's any weasels out there. <laughs> but but uh, they're, they're necessary, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a handshake, um, it's a look in the eye, it's... it's um, just a much simpler relationship, and I, I don't know where we are in, t in the business today, whether that still works or not, but uh, it's, it sure worked for us. So, um, gosh, i got to find my next one. There it is. In addition to relationships, how important is holding on to your intellectual property? Wow. I think it's a key moment for, uh, for Tetris to be still alive. I think that that's, that's how we were able to maintain such a strong brand for, for years and keep it, and keep it, uh, keep it strong, interesting, and modern. Because if, if, if the property change hands all the time, it, it, it rather dies soon. So I, I feel that, uh, that the fact that we own, uh, own uh, on intellectual property and, and protect it strongly really give the, the game life and inspiration. That's for sure. Yeah, so, so it, the fact that I licensed it to Nintendo early on and Nintendo turned around and, and uh, registered the copyrights and trademark in like 70 countries, that was a huge thing. You know, normally uh, upstart, upstart game designers or small potatoes, as you call me, um, 
will, don't have the wherewithal to register and to do all of that, you know, patent, trademark, copyright um, stuff. And so it was a really important thing to protect us around the world to make that alliance with Nintendo. Um, but it was a two-way street. Yeah. So Tetris is still very popular over the world, obviously. So do you think it's, it can be still the games which kind of uh, have the, such a broad appeal to all culture? Yeah, so if you create a game that is... Um, uh, Tetris is one way to do it. It's, it's a game which is more geometrical than anything else. <laughs> And so because it's geometrical, geometry doesn't change uh, depending on what country you live in. It's all... <laughs> every country lives along the same laws of physics and the same geometry. Uh, not so when it comes to games which involve a lot of culture. So, uh, for example, if you look at movies made in India and moves, movies made in Hollywood, they appeal to different audiences. And, uh, you know, my, my, somehow the, the TV landed on, the, on that channel and my wife said, what are you doing? You know, you, why are you watching this? And, uh, you know, it's just interesting to watch other culture stuff. But, With games, it doesn't necessarily translate, so what you think is funny may not be funny or may be even offensive someplace else. And so that's much more difficult to research when you're building a game which contains characters and language and, and I don't know, those kinds of things. So um, the simpler you make your game, the more likely it is to be cross-cultural. That's my thinking on this. Now, I, I know you still play Tetris, But what are some of your favorite games? What are some of the favorite games you play today? Well, well I'm still checking my account for World of Warcraft time to time. I spent lots of time on it. So I play all kinds of games, but, but still my heart is in puzzles. So I check all the puzzles. I try to not miss the important puzzles which is coming up. And now it's a really great time for puzzles, actually, because casual player... It's, it's, it's the most fair, favorable genre. So I still play Bejeweled, like Zuma, very like Cubis, uh, the only 3D, real 3D puzzle <laughs> in my collection, at least. Uh, Flow is a very good game, Threes. So all those puzzles are, are on my iPad and I never, <clears throat> and I never leaving it. So that's how it works. Your turn. My turn. <laughs> <laughs> Here, no, it's your turn. Or is it? It's your turn. It's my turn. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, two questions in a row. Looking back at what you've done over the past 30 years, what's one piece of advice you have for a developer just starting out with their new game or big idea? <sighs> I really hate to give advice, so I have just only one of them. In order to, in order to achieve a re, uh, really great, great goal and really come up with the good game, you need not just analyze everything and, and, have, uh, and have just desire to be the first and to make the best game. You need to really fall in love with what you do. So if you don't have this feeling, you do probably the very good game, probably, uh, probably kind of excellent game, but it will be never, it, it never be kind of outrageously and uh, kind of leg legendary game at all. So fall in love with what you do. That's, uh, that would be my advice. And uh, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, so my background is um, role-playing games. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons in college, and people around me used to look at me and say, why are you wasting so much time on this stupid game? And, uh, well, you know, I, I, made the first, I ended up making the first role-playing game in Japan. And, uh, and so my advice is, you know, don't listen to other people, <laughs> first of all. Because other people are not walking your life and they're not standing in your shoes. And, and if it was easy and you were going to do something that somebody else already did, then everybody would be doing it and it wouldn't be, 
it wouldn't be amazing. You know, the, to be a true artist, you have to do something that hasn't been done before. And so you need to search your, your I don't know, your mind, your, your history, your environment for things that you think are interesting and put those into a game and make something original. And I think that that is the, and then don't back down. Just keep on going on it, it because it's uh, um, the originality, the creativity. That is the thing that, that will make you stand out in the end. It's the reason this man is sitting here today. <laughs> well, okay. So what do you think is next for Tetris? So um, what do I think is next for Tetris? I, I think that Tetris is uh, going to become a sport, maybe someday it can be an Olympic sport. Because I think that uh, the time for uh, computer games as being quote unquote waste of time pastimes, I think that time is past. And we need to think seriously. If you, if you go back to 100 years ago, what did people do? They, they played sports because they needed to prepare themselves for a lime, lifetime of physical, physical activity. But today when we play computer games, what are we preparing ourselves for? We're preparing ourselves for a future in which most of what we do is going to be inside of virtual worlds. And so the practice of playing computer games, which all happen in virtual worlds, I think is exactly what our children need to prepare themselves for that lifetime of virtual labor. So I think that Tetris will become a sport, and I think hopefully it'll be in the Olympics. We have some wood somewhere. <laughs> Um, so, I have one last question uh, for you that isn't in the script, because we're out of questions. <laughs> and so, my question to you is, did anyone ever uh, threaten you to put you in jail if you didn't sign a paper? It was one time, and, and I tried to retain a very small piece of Tetris rights for myself, and they really threaten me. But you, but you push me away from this. It was merchandising rights, by yes. the way. Well, <laughs> and at it, that point, it looked really teeny piece of uh, everything. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> I said, I, I, you know, come to the States, do not, do not spend a day in jail. You will, pro you will not prove anything to anyone by doing this, and so, I think, I think it turned out okay. Yeah. It, it so in, uh, in wrapping up, um, I wanted to show you a, uh, the first professional Tetris player. And uh, when the credits are rolling, I need absolute silence. I just can't do it, and I promise it'll be really cool. This uh, video went viral, I think, two weeks ago. All right. One more. Uh, this one is more. a... One more. One more. There we go. Okay, here we go. All right. Quiet. Oh, that's them talking. <laughs> so he's, he's reached the end of the game, and now the pieces at the bottom of the well are invisible. So while the credits are scrolling, you can't even see, you can't see the pieces down the bottom. So he knows where they are. He's that good. Ooh, big mistake. <laughs> yeah, I say insane. <laughs> That's the future sport. And if you're wondering whether it's a spectator sport? No, 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 no go. Well, yes! Here's the oh. answer. <laughs> 